Okay, uh, shall we start, Justin? Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Pradhan, for accepting our invitation to give a talk on cavity ring down spectroscopy. For this, I request Professor Justin Thomas to kindly chair the session. Uh, thank you, Professor Pandey, for giving me one another opportunity to chair this session. And I would also like to thank Professor Manik Pradhan. And on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, I would I am happy to welcome him for this session as a special uh, uh, guest speaker. Okay, so it is my pleasure also to introduce to the audience Professor Manik Pradhan, who is an assistant professor in S N Bose National Center for Basic Sciences at Kolkata. So he has done his master in physics in University of Calcutta. Then he has completed his M.Tech in cryogenic engineering in IIT Garakpur. After that, he has spent two years as a visiting research scientist in Academia Sinica, Taiwan. And after that, he moved to University of Bristol, United Kingdom to do his PhD under the supervision of Professor Andrew Ewing. And after completing his PhD, uh, he has done two postdoctoral training, one in University of Kind of one in Cambridge University under the supervision of Professor Richard Lambert. And then he was uh, working as a postdoctoral research associate in the group of Richard and Zare in Stanford University for an year or so. So uh, ever since that, after that, you know, he's working in the Bose National Center for Basic Sciences. He has also received, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, honors, awards uh, for his excellent work. And recently, he is also inducted to be a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, London. And he also serves as an editorial board member to many journals, including sci scientific reports published by Nature Publishing Group. Okay, with this short introduction, I would like to welcome Professor Manik Pradhan to deliver his lecture in this forum. Welcome, Professor Manik Pradhan. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Thomas, for your kind uh, introduction. So, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Ravindra Prange uh, so, uh, for giving me uh, this opportunity to present uh, uh, my lecture so in this platform. So I would also like to thank all the students, uh, postdoc scientists, and the uh, faculty members uh, so who are actually listening my uh, lecture so at this moment. So in this uh, uh, lecture, so I will give you a brief overview of cavity ring down spectroscopy. So in this talk, uh, I'll try to explain uh, uh, the basic principle of cavity ring down spectroscopy. So how does this technique work? What are the advantages uh, of this technique compared to the traditional absorption spectroscopy? And I will also try to explain what are the possible applications. So, uh, that means where we can apply this technique. And uh, also you know, try to explain why this technique is so popular nowadays compared to the traditional absorption spectroscopy. So uh, you know the spectroscopy, so is the study of interactions between light and matter. So you can get a lot of information about an atom, molecule, radical, complexes. So depending on the type of interaction. And the traditional absorption spectroscopy is based on the Beer-Lambert law. So this law essentially tells you the relationship between absorbance and the concentration of a particular molecular species. So this is the Beer-Lambert law. So if you know the incident light intensity I naught, 
and the transmitted light intensity i, you can easily calculate the concentration x of a particular molecular species if you know the absorption cross section of the molecule at that particular wavelength. So now, the traditional absorption spectroscopy has two main drawbacks. The first one is it has a very limited sensitivity. So you can measure the minimum absorption coefficient of the order of 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 5 centimeter inverse. Because of uh, difficulty of measuring a small change in light intensity against a relatively large background signal. Okay, and another drawback is the lack of selectivity. So because of overlapping absorption features at a particular wavelength, so that is due to interference of other molecular species at a particular wavelength. So now to avoid all these things, there are two possibilities. Either you have to increase the sensitivity by uh, by increasing the optical path length uh, and by increasing the light matter interaction and also to avoid the lack of selectivity you have to use the high resolution spectroscopy technique so cavity ring down spectroscopy is such a technique so using this technique so you can increase the sensitivity and also you can improve the selectivity so now so briefly tell you what is cavity ring down spectroscopy okay so in briefly, it is an optical cavity enhanced absorption technique. So it enhances the light matter interaction by at least thousand fold in an optical cavity when the light is circulating in a high finesse optical cavity. So it is a laser based direct absorption spectroscopy technique. It gives the quantitative absorption in real time with high temporal and spatial resolution. So it is basically an ultra sensitive uh, absorption technique. And it provides the measurement in the time domain. So not intensity measurement. So it is basically insensitive to laser intensity fluctuations. So the most important thing, so this is a general spectroscopy technique. So having said this, what I mean you that, you can apply this technique in anywhere of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you want to do the experiment in the UV visible region, it is absolutely fine. If you want to extend this spectroscopy technique in the near infrared to mid infrared regions, it is fine. And you can also use this experimental technique in terahertz region. So depending on the what kind of science or applications you really want to do. So basically, it is a general spectroscopy technique. You can apply anywhere of the electromagnetic spectrum. Only you have to change the laser and optics depending on your applications. Okay, so now uh, just to listen carefully. So how this technique really works? Okay, so this is the high finesse optical cavity consisting of two ultra high reflectivity mirrors. The laser light is injected along the central axis of the cavity most of the light is reflected straight back of the input mirror and only a fraction of the light is transmitted through this mirror and then the light bounces back and forth inside the cavity. So this is called the cavity is ringing. So now when the light is bouncing back and forth inside the cavity, at each reflection, a very tiny amount of the light is transmitted through this output mirror. And if you put a detector here, you can see an exponential decay of light. So in this way, you can trap the laser light of the order of microsecond or nanosecond, and this gives huge effective path length far, far better than for any conventional multipass absorption cell. Okay, so and um, suppose there is no sample inside the cavity, it is completely empty cavity under vacuum, then the leaking light intensity can be described by this equation I is equal to I0 e to the power minus T by tau 0. This tau 0 is called the empty cavity ring down time. Now, if you put some sample inside the cavity, the gas sample, then the rate of decay becomes more faster because of absorption. Now, if you know the change in decay rate or the ring down time, you can easily calculate the concentration X of a particular molecular species if you know the absorption cross section sigma at that wavelength and see the speed of the light. So one of the beautiful things in this technique is that you can see that the ring down time, so depends only length of the cavity, the distance between the two mirrors and the reflectivity of the mirrors. 
So by measuring the ring down time, so rather than the absolute intensity of the laser pulse, short to short variations of the laser output is completely removed from your final spectra. So it is insensitive to laser intensity fluctuation. It's a time measurement. You can also calculate the limiting sensitivity by measuring the minimum absorption coefficient alpha mean. So basically tau zero is the characteristic lifetime of the light inside the cavity. Longer the lifetime means better sensitivity and this is the beauty of this technique. Okay, so, so now the question is how the light is trapped inside the cavity. The light is trapped inside the cavity only when the laser frequency matched with the frequency of the cavity mode. Now, when the light is moving back and forth inside the cavity, the transverse electromagnetic mode, what is called the TEM00 modes are established. Okay, so you have to somehow do the mode matching. So what we do that, so we basically fix the POG electric transducer, the PJT at the output mirror, and we apply a RAM voltage to sweep the cavity length over one free spectral range. So then at certain voltage or cavity length, the cavity mode comes into resonance with the laser frequency. So this figure is basically, so it is captured from the oscilloscope. So this, this spikes basically give you the intensity when the laser frequency comes into resonance with the cavity mode. Okay, so now once the light is trapped inside the cavity, the light has to be switched off if you use a continuous wave light. So then you can see the ring down signal. So basically before this, the intra-cavity light is built up. If you use a uh, continuous wave light, then you have to turn up the light with some very fast optical switching device. Then you can see the ring down time, okay? So now, the question is, why the cavity ring down spectroscopy is so unique? So there are a lot of advantages of this technique. You can see that the, the minimum absorption coefficient you can measure 10 to the power minus 11 to 10 to the power minus 13 centimeter inverse. But if you use a single pass cell or some kind of multi pass cell like Heriot cell or white cell, the typical sensitivity 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 5 centimeter. So 1 to 10 million times better improvement of the sensitivity. So it is an ultra sensitive technique. So you can measure the concentration of a gas sample parts per billion to parts per trillion levels. It's a huge, okay. So it gives the direct quantitative absorption measurement without any secondary calibration. If you know the absorption cross-section of that particular wavelength, so that gives you the direct quantitative measurement. It also provides the high molecular selectivity. So you can record a rotational line. You can see the hyperfine splitting of a rotational line. So this is the typical or the advantage of a cavity ring down spectroscopy technique. That's why it is so unique. Okay. So what are the typical parameters of a cavity ring down spectroscopy technique? So this is the optical cavity. Okay. So if you think that the length of the cavity is 50 centimeter, the distance between the two mirrors. And if you use a mirror, the reflectivity 99.99 percentage, the typical ring down time is 14 microsecond. If you just put the values, length and the reflectivity of the mirrors in that formula, so you can easily calculate the ring down time is 14 microsecond. And the TR, that is the round trip time, three nanoseconds. So light goes and back. The round trip time is three nanosecond. And effective optical path length is five kilometer. Okay. So, and the minimum absorption coefficient of the order of 10 to the power minus 11 centimeter inverse. So you can easily, so measure any gas sample concentration parts per billion to parts per trillion level, even the sub PPT levels. So now the currently the CRTS technique is used uh, just coupling the quantum cascade laser. So QCL, which is the quantum cascade laser in the mid infrared region. So mid IR QCL. So uh, why we use the mid infrared? Because we know that the mid infrared is called the molecular fingerprint region. So we can access most of the fundamental vibrational bands of the molecular species and their absorption cross sections are 10 to 1000 times higher than the overtone of combination bands that usually occur in the near infrared region. And the quantum cascade laser that is QCL has extremely narrow line width. So less than 0.001 centimeter inverse. So it gives the huge spectral resolution, it's extremely high spectral resolution. 
and the CIDS, uh, you will get the advantage of the high penis optical cavity. So, if you do the experiment, cavity ring down spectroscopy with quantum cascade laser, so you will get the high resolutions, order of this one, 0 0.001 centimeter inverse, and the high sensitivity. So, this is the beauty of combining the quantum cascade laser with the cavity ring down spectroscopy technique. Okay, so, so these are the some uh, CRPS spectroscopy technique that we have developed. So at our SNBO center uh, in my laboratory. So uh, this is the four CRTS setup uh, in the mid infrared regions at different wavelengths. One is 5.2 micron, so 6.2 and 7.8 micron. So depending on the various uh, applications also for doing the so different fundamental science. And also one is in the uh, UV visible region. So we have the four cavity ring down spectroscopy techniques at different wavelengths. So and we have published some different journals to establish the proof of concept and the development one. Okay, so now uh, I share the slide. Uh, uh, this is some kind of down the memory lane. So you can see that, uh, so actually, uh, so this is my PhD supervisor, Professor Andrew Oring. So I learned this technique in uh, 2005, so during my PhD days. So, and, and also another professor, Professor Richard Jair from Stanford University. So these are the two person who actually, so uh, I am extremely grateful for teaching me the magic tricks of bring down experiment. So, okay, so you can see this is almost uh, so 15 years before. So I was so young. So I was doing this uh, the experiment and trying to develop this uh, spectroscopy technique. And Professor Richard Zayers, he also visited 2016 in my laboratory and I was developing this setup. Okay, so now, uh, so far I have talked about so the cavity ring down spectroscopy in the gas space. So can we apply this technique in the condensed space? So solid and the liquid samples. So in principle, yes. So we can also do this technique. <laughs> so what we have done this thing. So this is the actual the optical ability. So there are two mirrors. So what we did that we actually so placed a prism at the center of the ability. And we use the total internal reflection right okay so what is the what is this so we have actually studied in our school level the physics that the light moves from so higher refractive index medium to a lower refractive index uh, so at an incident angle so greater than the critical angle the light is totally reflected at the first medium so and, and the boundaries and wave is generated and field is generated what is called the evanescent field and we use this evanescent field so in this technique. So basically the light is circulating. So in this optical cavity passing through a right angle prism and generating the evanescent field. So basically now you are generating the evanescent field on the top of the prism. Now if you put some solid and the liquid samples so like the water or something, then the molecules actually put up evanescent field through absorption and the scattering. So in this technique, there are two basic uh, inherent advantage and also we are using the high sensitivity of CRTS technique. So basically we can do any interfacial dynamics or real time kinetics. So using this kind of setup. Okay, so this is uh, the penetration depth that is the extension of the evanescent field is called the penetration depth, So it is the formula. So you can calculate the penetration depth. If you know the wavelength of the light incident angle, the refractive index, you can easily calculate the penetration depth. So this is the, the setup uh, for, for doing the cavity ring down spectroscopy in, in condensed space. So we have also developed, so this is the prototype system in a simple bed board, okay. So uh, this is called the evanescent wave coupled CRDS system. And uh, you can see that the cavity length is 120 centimeters, a little bit bigger. And your ring down time is around 160 nanosecond and the penetration depth is 180 nanometer. And you can also calculate the extinction or the absorption. So but if you know the ring down time, so, uh, so uh, with some baseline sample solution, the tau zero and tau with some sample solution is the speed of the light. So once you know the ring down time with and without your sample, you can also easily calculate the extinction. So in the uh, so of a molecular species or some kind of uh, the samples in the, the condensed space. So if you really want to know uh, this technique, so the, we have recently published so one paper, uh, it's a prototype evanescent wave system. If you are 
much more uh, interested in knowing about this technique. Right? So, so you can download this paper from the internet or you can just pop in an email to me, I will send you the paper. Okay, so now, uh, so I'll talk about uh, the applications of cavity ring down spectroscopy. Okay, so actually it is a general technique. So currently it has been applied in a variety of fields that people are using in the physics, chemistry, biology, the material science. Yeah, okay, so one of the exciting fields is the high resolution spectroscopy. So people are using the isotope analysis, atmospheric sensing, the enzymatic kinetics, the material science of the astrophysics. And one of the most fascinating area of research using the cavity ring down spectroscopy in the medical science, the people using this kind of spectroscopy technique for the analysis of human breath samples. So I will also talk about, so I will mainly talk about uh, the three different applications. One is applications in the chemistry. So that is in the isotope analysis or, or the isotopic fractionation chemistry. Then I will talk about uh, its applications in atmospheric science. And finally, I also talk about in applications in the medical science. Okay, so now first uh, talk about the cavity ring down spectroscopy in chemistry. So we'll mainly talk about the chemistry of water molecules, okay? Also the isotopic fractionation chemistry. So you know that the water is the most fundamental molecule in nature and it is used in physics, chemistry and the biology. But water is not simply water. So it exists in nature in various forms. So either in isotopic forms or, or in the nuclear spin isomeric form. Okay, so isotopic forms the same molecular species so that the mass number is different because the same number of protons and the different number of neutrons in the nucleus. And also, so different forms of the nuclear spin isomeric forms. Okay, so ortho and para. So depending on how the spins are oriented relative to one another, so then the water molecules will give you the uh, ortho and para water. Okay, so now when you talk about the water, so H2O, so usually it is called the light water. Okay, so or the ordinary ordinary water. But you know, there are two more waters. One is the heavy water, so D2O. Another is the semi-heavy water, HDO. So D2O is a doubly deuterated water. So there are two deuterium atoms and one oxygen atom. Okay, and the, uh, it is the stable isotope of hydrogen and the mass is double of uh, the hydrogen. Okay, so and uh, now the question is, so why we are interested in heavy water? Okay, so heavy water, you know, uh, it is widely used in the nuclear reactor as a moderator uh, to just to slow down the neutron. So the heavy water is widely used in nuclear power plant and also the heavy water is used in the chemistry and the biology. So we are very much interested about the heavy water. So now there are also, so when you talk about the water, so light water or heavy water or semi-heavy water, so the oxygen has three stable isotopes, oxygen 16, 17 and 18, which is the triple oxygen content isotope. So when we talk about the water, so basically it's a three water, heavy water, the three waters, isotopic water, the same uh, kind of features, but the mass number are different. Also the, the semi-heavy water. So okay, the oxygen 16, 17, 18. So okay, so total nine water molecular species. It is not uh, just one molecule. So it's a nine molecular species. So now, if you have a mixture of the light water and the heavy water, okay, so it immediately forms the one third molecular species that is the HDO, semi-heavy water. So H and D rapidly exchange and produce a third molecular species, semi-heavy water. Okay, so now, so this actually, uh, so you cannot, so, so actually, so you can buy a bottle of water or heavy water, but you cannot buy a bottle of semi-heavy water. You cannot actually separate semi-heavy water chemically, but can we actually observe the semi-heavy water spectroscopically? Yes, actually we can observe the semi-heavy water and you cannot buy the semi-heavy water because all three molecules actually exist in equilibrium. Okay, so now, so if we have a mixture of the light water and the heavy water, you can see that uh, basically there are the nine water molecular species, H2O 16, 17, 18, H2O 16, 17, 18, or H2O 16, 17, 18. 
So why we are interested uh, this kind of reaction? So we want to actually understand the isotopic fractionation chemistry and also the triple oxygen content isotopic fractionation chemistry when there is a mixture of light water and heavy water. So, okay. so you can see that this is the natural abundance of D2O and HDO. So you can see that this is extremely low abundance. So D2O, so 2.4 on something 10 to the power minus, uh, minus 6. Okay, it's very, very low abundance. And if you really want to detect such a level of concentration, you really do need and such an extraordinary sensitive technique. If you have a pure water see, and also the air, you can see that the typical concentration of uh, the HDO or the DTO parts per billion to parts per trillion level is a very, very low concentration. So, okay. so now this is the vibrational spectroscopy of D2 and HDO. So we know that uh, the vibrational frequency, this is the, we all we know this is the formula, nu is equal to 1 by 2 i pi root over k by mu, k is the force constant and mu and nu is the reduced mass. So if the masses are different, okay, so then the vibrational frequency will be different. If you see that the light water, the three, ox three the typical oxygen content three isotope, uh, and the masses are different, uh, oxygen 16, 17, 18, the masses are 18, 19, and 20. Also the heavy water, uh, the 20, 21, 20, 22, semi heavy water also 19, 20, 21, okay. So, so you can see that uh, basically the nine water molecular species with the similar kind of masses. So now all three water molecules have the three fundamental vibrational modes, uh, the symmetric, the bending, and the asymmetric stretch, and these are their vibrational frequency. One of the interesting thing is that you can see that the masses are same. So H2O 18, 20, uh, the, the D2O 16 or 20, also the semi heavy water, H2O 17, that is the 20. So the isotope selective detection is extremely challenging. So now, uh, uh, why the measurement is done in the gas phase? So why you are interested uh, the measurement in the gas phase, not in the liquid phase? So you can see that uh, the liquid phase spectra, so taken the FTIR and the ATIR, it was published in 2002. You can see that the liquid spectra actually covers a wide range in the infrared region. And there is a strong overlapping of the, of the molecular species. So it is very, very difficult to selectively detect D2O, HDO, okay? And also there are a lot of complex data analysis. So to avoid the, these things, so we really need uh, some kind of technique so that will give you the high selectivity and the sensitivity and so and we have done this experiment in the in the gas phase so we have already talked that so if we have a mixture of d2 and hdo this exchange reaction takes place the h and d basically exchange and produce the semi heavy water so if we really want to detect that uh, the d content the deuterium enriched in a mixture so we have to actually detect that the heavy water and the semi heavy water at the same time. So then we can get the total, the D content. So in that particular mixture. Okay, so this is uh, the high resolution uh, CRT spectra of D2 at 7.8 micron. So these are the interference free lines that was recorded by the CRG spectroscopy technique. So these lines actually originated from the hot bank li lines. And these are the lines actually originated from the, the fundamental vibrational band of the D2O molecule at 7.8 microns. Okay, so these are the, uh, the high resolution spectra of D2O in the gas phase in the mid infrared region at 7.8 micron. So what is the typical detection limit? So based on this uh, spectra, we have calculated that the minimum detection limit for D2O is 1.66 parts per billion, so at this particular wavelength. So, okay, so if we uh, use this spectral transition, so we have the enough sensitivity, so we can detect the D2O concentration in the gas space by probing this line. So these are the very exciting things. You can see that uh, uh, the HDO, the semi-heavy water, we can also probe the semi-heavy water by capturing down spectroscopy technique. So not only the HDO, we can also specifically track the triple oxygen content semi-heavy water. So HDO 17, HDO 18, also the HDO 16. So three isotopic species of oxygen 
in the semi heavy water we can actually basically trap so in the gas phase spectroscopy by means of crts technique so these are the experimental line center position so for all these molecular species these are the hydrogen database the theoretical and we can also calculate the concentration so by just uh, from from on this uh, uh, the spectra so why this is important okay so if we know the spectral transition their line center position their absorption cross section so this kind of spectra can be used for leak detection of any vapor samples or any kind of impurity measurement if you have any isotopic samples suppose there is some leak from the nuclear power plant so when the d2o comes in contact with the atmospheric water vapor it immediately forms the semi heavy water so using this kind of spectral line the interference free spectral line we can easily calculate the concentration of d2o and hdo at the same time using the capturing the spectroscopy technique okay so this is another very interesting things so you can see that so if we have a mixture of d2o and uh, the h2o what will actually happen so how the concentration of hdo or d2o changes you can so this figure basically uh, tells you so how the d2o or hdo concentration changes so it increasing the fraction of d2o in h2o you can see that so this is the profile of uh, d2o and this is the profile of hdo okay this is this thing all these are experimentally determined value and this is some kind of theoretical or it is just the fitting or the, the fitting from the equilibrium equation and so this is very interesting things the hdo concentration actually it is the symmetric at one is to one ratio and this gives some kind of uh, the practical complication so if you really want to measure the d2o concentration you have to actually measure the both the content the d2o and the hdo at the same time so this is one scenario so you can see that so if you so due to this symmetric profile in nature the 5% d2o and h2 and 95% d2o so basically it is the same okay so due to this the symmetric profile nature so basically so you have to measure both h2o and d2o to get the accurate assessment of deuterium content in a sample okay so now i have uh, talked about uh, so the h2o and the d2o so in the gas phase using cavity ring down spectroscopic technique okay so now if you have any questions so so please uh, ask me so in the chat box hello uh, rabindra or uh, professor thomas can you hear me i am able to hear you. Um, so we will have a small break to entertain the questions from the participants. If there are any questions, either you can ask directly or type in in the chat box. Uh, can I have a ask? Uh, sure. Yeah. So in your measurement, I was looking at your y axis, x axis, and I saw that your wavelength is more or less to in the bending range of the water, right? So I'm wondering that they may also interfere with with your measurement, right? Or the first over overtone of the bending one, because you are your path length is so long that uh, bending mode will all the first overtone of mode will exactly overlap with your OD stretch mode. So how do you for that? We have uh, uh, we have uh, chosen the line so in such a way so that there is no actually the interference line because we are probing a single rotational line. So your resolution is zero point zero zero one centimeter inverse. So one particular vibration band. So we are actually probing just the one rotational line, and we check that from the simulations or any other. Uh, so using the different gases, uh, so we didn't find any kind of overlapping uh, the absorption features. It's a very high resolution uh, thing. Okay, so can I go ahead? Okay, so yeah, if there are no more questions, we can continue with the session. Okay, 
So now uh, I will talk about in some uh, different things, the cavity ring down spectroscopy uh, in the nuclear spin isomers of the water. So if we do this kind of experiment, this gives a new picture of the spin exchange processes of water and the heavy water in chemical reaction. So you know that uh, the hydrogen is a spin half particle. So it's a fermion. It obeys the Fermi Dirac statistics. And the deuterium, it's a spin one particle. It's a boson, the Bose-Einstein statistics, okay? So these are the spin state. So these are the spin state. So depending on the how the spins are oriented. Okay, so if, the, if there are the parallel spin, so the water is the ortho water, it is the triplet state. And if the spins are anti-parallel, it is the water is para water, it's a single state. And ortho and para ratio is three is to one. So it is already known and the people have already verified uh, this theoretical prediction. Okay, so now, for the D2, so D2 has also different spin state. So the spin de degeneracy is six, okay? So these are the ortho D2. And for the para D2, the spin degeneracy is three. The higher order spin state is uh, the ortho state and the lower order spin state is para state. And ortho para ratio is two is to one. So, so far there was no experimental verification of this theoretical prediction ortho and para. And one of the challenging question is that when there is a mixture of heavy water and the light water, so is this the reaction is spin dependent? Because you can see that the hydrogen is a fermion spin half and deuterium is a spin one boson. So one is spin half, another is spin one, and it creating a third molecular species HDO, so, the, so it has no spin. So the, my question was that so whether this, this chemical reaction was spin dependent or not. Okay, so it was really challenging question. It is extremely challenging to probe and separate ortho and para spin isomers of water in the gas space. And also it is extremely challenging to produce water that is not a mixture of both ortho and para. So still this, these are the open questions. So we have started uh, in this field uh, working just very uh, recently. And we are also in the very preliminary stage uh, uh, so in this field. Okay, so now we successfully probed the ortho and para spin waters, the spin isomers of uh, the water molecule by CRGS technique. So we can probe the P16, okay, so this is the rotational line. So using this rotational line, so we can actually track the ortho water and also using this, the Q10, the rotational transition, we can also track the para water and we have the ortho and para ratio so th this was the three theoretical prediction three is to one and ortho para ratio experimental we are so very close to the experimental uh, uh, the duplication okay so now so this is uh, uh, the ortho and para spin isomer of d2 by crgs spectroscopy technique we could also successfully uh, probe the spin uh, isomers of the D2O and ortho para ratio. So we got uh, the experimental and, and the theoretical uh, values are closely matched. Okay, so using this spectroscopy technique, so we can also probe ortho and para nuclear spin isomers of D2O by this uh, CRG spectroscopy technique using this rotational transition. So now we ask this question, so because uh, in the pure D2O, so we obtained the ortho and para ratio, okay. But if the if the mixture is 50-50, okay, so one is to one ratio. So then the ortho para ratio is actually changes. So it is actually enhanced, okay. So basically, we can say that the D and exchange reaction is favored through the para nuclear state of D2O in the residual D2O of the reaction medium. So this gives us some kind of new things that to understand the nuclear spin chemistry in a mixture of light and heavy water. So in this, up to this, so what we have learned that we can probe the nuclear spin isomers of water as well as the D2O in the gas space. And also we have seen that, so if there is a mixture of one is to one, there is a, some kind of uh, the ortho para ratio is changes from the statistical to the equilibrium value. 
and it gives some kind of the, the reaction is basically favored through the paranuclear state. So, okay, so this uh, things, uh, so we have recently published uh, just uh, one week uh, before. So uh, actually this uh, came in the chemical physics. So if someone is interested in knowing more about the earth and paranuclear spin isomers of D2, so you can read this paper. Okay, so now I will talk about the applications of chemical ring down spectroscopy in atmospheric chemistry and the trace gas sensing. We'll show you so using the cavity ring down spectroscopy technique, we can probe any trace molecules in the atmosphere. We can probe their isotopes in ambient air to understand the atmospheric chemistry. So this is one of the beautiful example, the trace detection of ambient nitric oxide at 5.2 micron by cavity ring down spectroscopy technique. So why this molecule is important? This is, this is an important atmospheric uh, molecular species. This plays an important role in NOx chemistry. But the typical mixing ratio in the troposphere is 10 to 100 ppb. It's a very low concentration. So if you really want to detect such level of concentration, the nitric oxide, so you have to use an ultra sensitive detection technique. So using the CRGS method, you can easily so detect such level of concentration. So this is one of the high resolution spectra of the lambda doublet splitting of the rotational line. You can see that uh, the CRGS technique has enormous capability to resolve a spectral line. Just to, you can see that and if substates of a rotational line and using this lambda doublet splitting so uh, we have detected the nitric oxide concentration in ambient air this is one representative example so we can uh, measure the nitric oxide concentration in our uh, atmosphere at the level of 100 ppt this is just one example so around the 50 ppb so uh, so this spectra basically gives you the concentration of nitric oxide in the atmosphere is around 50 ppb. So this is some kind of pressure broadening effect. That means if you increase the pressure in the optical cavity, then the splitting disappears. That means you have to do the experiment at the low pressure to avoid the pressure broadening effect. So this is another uh, very beautiful example of application of CIGS spectroscopy for the detection of atmospheric nitrous oxide and the methane. So we all know that, so these two gases, the nitrous oxide and the methane are the greenhouse gases. They actually contribute to the global warming. So they have their anthropogenic and their biogenic sources. They are atmospheric lifetimes of, uh, for the, uh, into 120 years, okay? And the methane is three years. This is actually calculated, uh, so from the photolysis and to the, the radical concentration. So you can see that, so when this, these molecules are emitted in the atmosphere. So they actually uh, goes through various oxidation processes and produces the ozone. So that means due to their stability and the thing is that very small change in concentration, it has a huge effect in the atmosphere. So we have to detect the N2O and the CH4 at the same time by with the ultra high sensitivity at the level of parts per billion to parts per trillion level to understand the atmospheric chemistry. So this is the example. So for the detection of nitrous oxide level by the CIGS technique. So we have used this rotationally resolved absorption line of into so at 5.2 micron. So using this rotational line just by probing this line so we can measure the nitric, uh, nitrous uh, oxide concentration in ambient air. Also, just to ch ch check, so how the nitrous oxide concentration varies in different environments. So we collected the samples uh, around the Kolkata, okay, so from different places. So the industrial sector, high traffic area, so, so high traffic area, agricultural land, residential complex. We can see that, so the into actually, that is from 400 to 600 ppb, okay? And also, uh, it's a one, just a one week measurement. That means it gives an indication that using the cavity ring down spectroscopy technique, you can monitor the nitrous oxide concentration uh, so in, 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 in real time. Okay, so now this is another example of the detection of methane in ambient air.
So we have also uh, detected the methane concentration at various places. So using the ring down spectroscopic technique, we probed uh, the, uh, the fundamental vibrational band of methane at 7.5 micron. So it is possible so to detect the methane concentration in the ambient air at the parts per billion level. So this is now we focused uh, uh, the isotopes of methane. So, okay, so, so you know that the carbon has two, two isotopes, carbon 12 and the carbon 13. So carbon 12 CH4 and carbon 13 CH4, these are the two stable isotopes of uh, methane. The 12 CH4 is 98.82 percentage and 13 CH4 is the 1.1 percentage. So why we are interested of in measuring the isotopic methane? Because the isotopic methane will give you actually the information about the nature of the source. So depending on the isotopic fractionation, the isotopic species are changes. Okay. And so why the spectra are different? Because this is the vibrational frequency, because these two molecules, uh, the, they have the different masses, the reduced mass is different. So their vibrational frequency is different. Okay. So it is possible to detect using the gas based spectroscopy uh, 12 CH4 and 13 CH4 by spectroscopically. And uh, this is some kind of uh, they, they are uh, vibrational uh, band. So we have used the new for fundamental vibrational band for the detection of uh, 12 CH4 and 13 CH4. So this is the simulated spectra from the Hytran database. So we choose the line in such a way, this is some the rotational line, so, and there is no overlapping absorption features, particularly water, carbon dioxide, any other molecular species. And this is the experimental CIT spectra of 12 CH4 and 13 CH4, okay? And uh, this is the atmospheric measurement. So 12 CH4 and 13 CH4, you can measure the 12 CH4 ppm level and 13 CH4 ppb level. So what is, uh, we can understand that. So using this high resolution spectroscopic technique, we can measure the carbon 12 and carbon 13 isotopes of methane. So, uh, so in the in the gas space. So this is one of the uh, unique advantage of ring down spectroscopy. You can selectively probe the two different isotopes of methane in ambient air. Okay, so this is another very beautiful example of application of CRD spectroscopy for monitoring of different isotopes of sulfur. Okay, so we know that the sulfur has three stable isotopes, so 32, 33, and 34. So these are the natural abundance of the sulfur compound. So why the sulfur isotope uh, are very important? Because if we can detect the different isotopes of sulfur, it can give you the information about the sulfur isotope geochemistry. You can understand the biological sulfur cycle also the marine sedimentary cycle and nature and origin of fossil fuels, etc. So now we have to find a spectroscopic window for simultaneous detection of atmospheric H2 isotope. So we have found, so this is actually the high trend simulation. So within a single laser scan, actually you can detect the three stable isotopes of sulfur. Okay, so this is the high trend simulation. And this is the experimental using some standard calibration gases. So use the 327 ppm and the cavity pressure 22. And we use the quantum cascade laser wavelength 7.4 micron, 7.00 nanometer. Okay. So using this 0 0.40 centimeter inverse, okay, using this laser can, you can actually simultaneously detect the three stable isotopes of hydrogen sulfides, 32, 33, and 34 in a single laser scan. So then we have tried to measure the ambient uh, sulfur isotope. So you can see that. So when you do the ambient measurement, so the ring down signal was actually getting saturated because so very close, so there is a water line. Okay, so if we can handle the water or if you can remove the water, then you can easily scan the three isotope in ambient air. So that means, so you can monitor the three stable isotope of sulfur in hydrogen sulfide by cavity ring down spectroscopy technique. So then if you have a solid samples, okay, so we really want to know, 
So how much abundance of three isotopes, which is the sodium sulfide, it's the, it's the solid sample, using some in vitro chemical reactions, uh, uh, so we can identify the three stable isotopes. So uh, actually, so how much the abundance, so the present in, uh, uh, in the sodium sulfide. So then we take the vapor sample, inject into the optical cavity, sign the laser beam, scan this particular uh, the, the wavelength, then you can quickly uh, determine the three the, the abundance of three isotopic species. So 32, 33, and the 34. So that means using the gas space spectroscopy, that is the cavity ring down spectroscopy, you can identify the natural abundances of three stable isotopes in a solid sample. So this is one of the very important observation uh, uh, using the cavity ring down spectroscopy technique. Okay, so now, so far, we have talked about uh, the application of cavity ring down spectroscopy technique for a small molecule, right? Very small molecule, one and two carbon. Now the question is, so can we apply the CRTS spectroscopy uh, for a, a complex and uh, the bigger molecule? Yeah, so yes, actually, so we can also apply. So uh, we applied uh, this spectroscopy technique for a 1,3-butadiene molecule. So why we are interested? Because 1,3-butadiene is one of the most atmospheric, uh, the, uh, the atmospheric pollutant and it is a carcinogenic gas. Okay, and uh, its concentration 1 to 10 ppb in ambient air it also plays an important role in atmospheric chemistry. So, but you can see that uh, the spectra, as this is a bigger molecule, the four carbon atom, so is rotational vibrational spectra so congested and overlap with many other molecular species. Okay, so it is uh, extremely difficult to resolve this spectra with ordinary spectroscopy technique. But using the CIDS spectroscopy, it is uh, possible to resolve the, this spectra uh, of a such kind of uh, uh, a bigger and the complex uh, molecular species. So this is the uh, high resolution CRG spectra of 13 butadiene at 6.2 micron. So this is the experimental spectra and this is the simulated spectra. That is, we have used the PIGOFAR simulation. So using the Gaussian 16, we have calculated the different uh, the parameters then we have utilized this parameter put into the pico for simulation. Then we have verified the so theoretical and the experimental spectra. So, uh, so at 6.2 micron, okay, so we have uh, used this quantum cascade laser at this particular wavelength to resolve this spectra. And 925 rotational vibrational line we have assigned. So uh, now we try to find for the detection of ambient 13 butadiene. Okay, so we have actually found one very unique interference free spectral region at 6.2 micron where you can actually detect 1,3 butadiene in ambient air. So this is experimental spectra, this is the, uh, the simulated spectra. And uh, you can see that uh, your ring down time is for this particular molecule 7.8 microsecond and your minimum detection limit 5 ppb. So it is quite possible to detect the 1,3 butadiene molecule in ambient air without any interference, okay? So now, uh, so before uh, going to uh, another topic, uh, so this is the uh, my last topic. Uh, so if, if anybody has any questions, so please uh, feel free to so ask me. Yeah, if there are any questions, now participants can use this break to ask questions. Okay, so if if, if um, there is no question, so so uh, so I can move forward. <laughs> Shall I move? Uh, yeah, so. please. Okay, so now uh, this is the last part of my talk. Um, so cavity ring down spectroscopy in medical science. Okay, this is one of the most fascinating area of research uh, in, in medical science. Okay, 
So I'll try to explain. So how the cavity ring down spectroscopic technique can be used in medical science, particularly in non-invasive medical diagnosis using the human breath analysis. Okay, so now for what are the molecules actually present in our breath samples? Okay, so you can see that when we exhale, so there are 3000 molecular species. So in our breath samples, so you can see that the carbon dioxide, uh, so, uh, so actually, so we, we inhale around 400 ppm and around the 40,000 ppm when you exhale. So carbon dioxide is the major metabolite in human breath sample. So we also exhale, so different types of volatile organic compounds, so alkanes, aldehyde, ketones, alcohols, and so many things. And, the, and uh, their concentrations are parts per billion to parts per trillion levels, okay. But the interesting thing is that, so when our health changes, right, or when we have any kind of disease or metabolic syndrome or any kind of bacterial infection, these molecules actually changes and also the underlying chemistry changes. And some of the molecular species are actually related to the pathogenesis of the disease. So these molecules are called the biomarker or the breath print. Okay. So if we can track these molecular species, so we can identify what kind of disease or bacterial infection is actually present in, in, in human subject. So now the question is, so how these molecules are produced in our breath samples? There are several reasons. So usually these molecules are produced by uh, endogeneously. So because of some biochemical reactions occurring inside our body as a part of the metabolic process, these molecules may uh, might come from any bacteria or any microorganism, or it might come from, from inhaled air or depending also in your food habit. So what kind of foods are actually you are taking every day. So uh, these are the possible reasons the breath molecules are produced. So now why the breath prints or the breath marker are so important for the diagnosis? You know, so this is uh, because you have to give the, only the breath samples. So it is a painless, it's a non-invasive diagnosis. So there is no risk for the patient. You can repeat your test as many times as you want. So this is safe and quick diagnosis. And also you can collect your breath samples uh, in field clinics or operating room. And this kind of methodology is attractive for infant children or the lactating or the pregnant woman. Also, this molecular species just by the Excel Okay, so it, it, it will give you some kind of early diagnosis of the diseases and also follow up of the patient. So if we know the breath print, so we can easily diagnose non-invasively without going for any blood test or any kind of endoscopy and the biopsy test. Okay, so now I'll talk about, uh, so how the different isotopes of carbon and the oxygen can be used for the medical diagnosis. So we have utilized the CRGS technique for recording uh, or for monitoring these different isotopes of carbon and the oxygen molecule. So carbon dioxide is the major metabolite in human breath, but it's not a disease marker itself. So exhale breath is a 4 percentage and inhale 0.04 percentage. So basically carbon dioxide is not the disease marker, but if we look into the different isotopes, that is oxygen 18 and the carbon 13, so these molecules may contain the signature of a variety of medical conditions. So now the question is why we are interested in oxygen 18 isotopic chemistry in human breath sample. So you all know that when the glucose is metabolized, carbon dioxide is produced, okay? And oxygen 18 is the third major abundant isotopes, okay? So it is 0.394 percentage and how the oxygen 18 is produced in our breath samples. You can see that, so in our blood samples, so the oxygen 16 of CO2 molecule and oxygen 18 of water, they are rapidly exchanged to produce the oxygen 18 of CO2 molecule. Then this oxygen 18 of CO2 molecule is transported through the blood, comes to your lungs, and then it is excreted in your exhaled breath. So this is the source of oxygen 18 in our breath samples. 
So now this isotopic exchange reaction is controlled by one of the metalloenzymes, this is the carbonic anhydride. Okay, so this carbonic anhydride basically controls the hydration and the dehydration of CO2. And carbonic anhydride, that is the CA metalloenzyme, is also associated with the altered metabolism. And we all know that as the diabetes is an altered metabolism, so there might be some kind of link of oxygen 18 isotope in the diabetic patient. Then we did the experiment, that is the measurement of oxygen 18 isotope of CO2 molecules for different types of diabetic patients, the control pre-diabetic and the type 2 diabetic patient. So you can see that how the oxygen isotopic fractionation of XL breath CO2, that means, so how the oxygen 18 changes for a normal pre-diabetic and type 2 diabetic patient with a two hour oral glucose tolerance test. So you can see that, so the type two diabetic patient excel more oxygen 18 so than a normal patient. And okay, so there is a significant isotopic enrichment of oxygen 18 for the type two diabetic patient and isotopic depletion for the normal patient. So why actually this was happened? So to investigate this, so we have also measured the carbonic anhydrous activity in the blood samples. You can see that this isotopic enrichment and the depletion are strongly correlated with the changes in CA activity in the blood samples. So that's why, so there is a change in carbonic anhydrous activity, also the oxygen isotopic fractionation. We can see the difference of oxygen 18 isotopic fractionation in excel breath samples for the normal pre-diabetic and the type 2 diabetic patient. So then, we try to uh, investigate uh, that what are the cutoff values. Okay, so this is so uh, don't worry. This is uh, this is called actually the receiver operating characteristic curves. These are widely used in medical science. So the, all these values are actually the oxygen eighteen isotopes of CO two molecule measured by the cavity ring down spectroscopy technique. And we found that so this is some kind of cutoff values using some statistical analysis. We found that if the oxygen 18 value, this is the DOB delta over baseline, okay, so 2.27 per mil, it is the, not the percentage per mil, parts per thousand, so if it is value greater than equal 2.27, you are in the type 2 diabetic, if it is value some kind of this less than this, you are the normal, and if the values in between this, you are the pre-diabetic patient, so oxygen 18 is a potential non-invasive biomarker for the assessment of the diabetic patient. So this is then we have tried to understand how the carbon-13 isotope of CO2 molecules, uh, the changes for the normal and the pre-diabetic patient. So we know that the diabetics is, uh, is the one of the most common metabolic disorder all over the world. And currently India has the highest number of diabetic patients, okay. So and if uh, because uh, if the insulin uh, is not working well, so then your blood glucose actually increases and you have the diabetes. Okay, so now what we, so what is the science behind this? Because if the suppose insulin for the diabetic patient, if the insulin is not working well, then the less glucose is transported through the cell, then it will produce the less carbon, uh, carbon 12 CO2. Now if you replace them, so uh, 13 C which is glucose, so then the 13 CO2 will be the less because of the uh, the glucose uptake is impaired and uh, you get the less carbon-13 so due to ins the impaired insulin action. So then we monitor the carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotope ratio for the diabetic, pre-diabetic and the normal patient, how this the values are changes. So we can exactly observe this, the hypothesis is right because we can see that so within the three hours in the oral glucose tolerance test, you can see that the type 2 diabetic patient actually excel less carbon-13, so due to insulin, uh, uh, the impaired insulin, the action. Okay, so now I will talk about, uh, okay, so these are the, the new breath print, okay, so we have uh, uh, the elaborately discussed, so these two things, the oxygen-18 isotopes uh, in the two, uh, the two papers, uh, one is uh, the type 2 diabetics a patient, another is the type 1 and type 2 diabetics. We found that oxygen 18 is a potential biomarker of the new breath print 
for the assessment of the diabetes. So we measure this oxygen-18 isotope or the carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopes by the chemical ring of spectroscopic degree because oxygen-18 is very, very less parts per billion to parts per trillion level. Okay, so now I'll talk about, so another application of cavity ring down spectroscopy. <coughs> that is, uh, we can identify the stomach infection using this ring down spectroscopy technique. So the stomach infection means the this is one infection, it is the Helicobacter pyroli infection. This is one kind of bacteria. So almost everyone has this bacteria in their stomach, okay. And more than 50% of the population so have this bacteria okay but the interesting thing is that this infection is often asymptomatic so having said this what i mean you that most of the time you really don't face any kind of sign or symptoms related to this bacteria so when you have some problem in the gastro in, so in your stomach then you go to a doctor basically the gastroenterologist so what the gastroenterologists do? So they do the endoscopy and the biopsy test. Okay. So this is, we all know. So this is very painful and invasive technique. And these kind of endoscopy based techniques are not suitable for early diagnosis and follow up of the patient. Okay. So we really want to detect such kind of non-invasive technique. So without going for any endoscopy and the biopsy test. Okay. So this is the concept. This is the idea and the science. So the 13C enriched isotope kinetics, okay. So this is a simple chemical reaction, the hydrolysis of urea, okay. So these bacteria secrete the uris enzyme and we give a 13C enriched urea, that is FDA approved. So what happens that, so when you take a 13C enriched urea, in presence of the uris enzyme, this 13C urea breaks down into ammonia and 13CO2. Then 13CO2, is transported through your blood streams, comes to your lungs, and you excrete the 13 CO2. That means if you have this bacteria in your stomach, we will excel more carbon 13 than a healthy person. This is the concept is very simple. Okay. And we did the experiment on H pyrrole positive and the H pyrrole negative patient with the collaboration with an hospital. Okay. So in, in Kolkata. So you can see that this is the H parallel positive patient and H parallel negative patient. You can see that so uh, there is a significant change uh, in carbon 13 of CO2 molecules for H parallel infected patient. Hmm. So, okay. so now these are the some kind of clinical trials is going on. So in the hospital. So okay, and to verify all these things, so uh, using the this is the laser spectroscopy, the CRDS measurement, and this is the mass spectrometry measurement. So later on, we have changed from ring down to the mass spectrometry technique, and your diagnostic sensitivity and specificity more than ninety five percentage. Okay, so basically by measuring the carbon twelve and carbon thirteen isotope ratio of CO two molecule we can identify the bacterial infection, that is H. pyrrole bacterial infection, which is responsible for the peptic ulcer disease or some kind of gastritis problem. So, and the common methodology is endoscopy and the biopsy test, okay? So we can avoid this test as a complementary test. We can do just the, using the breath sample analysis. Okay, so this is some kind of ROC, the, the receiver operating uh, the, uh, and the car, uh, it is uh, used in the medical science, the sensitivity versus specificity and uh, this is the cutoff value, so 2.9 per mil. That means if you, if your value, that means carbon 12 and carbon 13 isotope ratio is, uh, uh, is more than 2.9 per mil, then you are positive and if it's less than this, then you are negative. And also, so depending on the carbon 12 and carbon 13 isotope ratio, you can also identify the so level of uh, the uh, uh, the infection, whether you are in the initial stage of infection or in the advanced stage of the infection. Okay, so this is so recently one of the very interesting findings. So we have also monitored the semi-heavy water in human exhaled breath for each pyrrole positive and the negative patient. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is the endoscopic pictures taken from the 
the real patient uh, who actually done this their endoscopy and the biopsy test from the biopsy sample so doctor did their the experiment for to identify h parallel positive and negative and we have also done the experiment in human breath samples so harboring the h parallel positive and the negative patient you can see that there is a significant difference of h parallel positive and the negative patient the, the excretion dynamics the changes okay and we have also tried to calculate uh, so uh, this is the diagnostic cutoff value uh, you the diagnostic sensitivity how how accurately you can tell the positive patient the specificity or how accurately you can tell the negative patient so more than the 97th percentage okay so hdo is a new breath brain measured by the cavity ring down spectroscopy technique this is one of the beautiful application in the medical science of cavity ring down spectroscopy technique so this is uh, the things so you can take the drinking water then the reactions is happening inside your stomach and h parallel plays a critical role then you exhale different uh, isotopes of the water you measure the different isotope by the ring down spectroscopy track the hdo molecule there is a significant change of hdo then you can identify uh, the uh, so at, the, at a at a particular time to 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 calculate the diagnostic cutoff value and from this diagnostic cutoff value you can tell whether the you have the h parallel infection or not without going for any endoscopy and the biopsy test so this is uh, uh, this news actually came uh, uh, our honorable minister dr harshvardhan so he tweeted so so the scientists found the new breath brain for detecting ulcer causing gastric pathogens okay so and also we have developed one so device okay so initially we did the experiment by cavity ring down spectroscopy now to reduce the cost and to make it much more compact so so we have developed this pyro breath so you can actually uh, so using this the device we can identify whether you have this h pyrrole infection or not or not only the h pyrrole infection we can also tell whether you have the ulcer or not so for this we have also found different types of breath prints okay so these are the technology so we have developed it is under the clinical trial and under the process of technology transfer to few companies okay so now uh, almost the finished uh, okay so this is the summary of crds uh, spectroscopy technique so uh, i have talked about the basic principle of cavity ring down spectroscopy technique how does it work so why this technique is so important what are the unique advantages of this technique compared to the traditional absorption spectroscopy and i have also talked about briefly the application of crds technique in environmental sensing so we can detect several atmospheric the trace gases by ring down spectroscopy technique we can measure the concentration parts per billion to parts per trillion level also and also uh, we have shown the application of this uh, so technique in medical science we have briefly talked about uh, the reaction kinetics of, uh, so in terms of uh, the heavy water and uh, the light water so how the isotopic fractionation changes so in that particular uh, the reaction by this spectroscopy technique we have also shown that high precision measurement of the isotopes using this spectroscopy technique so yes this is a general technique so it can be applied so in 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 many other fields i have just talked about only three applications environmental biomedical and the isotopic chemistry so uh, this is uh, one of the latest review that is published by indian academy of science so if someone is, uh, is much more interested in knowing about this technique uh, so you can so read this review article so uh, uh, or uh, just you can send me on email so if you want to copy or you can download from the internet so this is very very important review uh, there are a lot of in, uh, the uh, the information so you will get this is published in so 2020 just a few months before okay and this is an all special review just published on a few years before this is much more advanced uh, things uh, uh, the recent technological like uh, the advancement okay so what are the so the because the technique has been modified day by day okay so there are huge things uh, the technique has been greatly modified uh, several variants of crds techniques are now the people are actually working 
So you can see that the frequency comp, the two photon capturing down spectroscopy, fiber optics were capturing down spectroscopy. There are many, many techniques coupling with the ring down spectroscopy technique. This is one of the very important annual review articles. So, uh, so you can also read this uh, uh, the review. So you will get a lot of the information. Okay, so this is, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, the funding agency, Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Art Science, Department of Biotechnology. So provide, uh, for providing me the funding so for development uh, uh, this work uh, because uh, it was extremely difficult to get the funding, but uh, so they have provided uh, me a lot of funding so to develop such kind of so unique experimental facilities so in our country. And now, uh, so this is my current group and thank you very much. Uh, so please stay well and safe and have a blessed day. And if you have any questions, so please feel free to ask me. I'll try to give you the answer. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Manik, for a very nice illustrative presentation. Now the lecture is open for a discussion. So you can also post your questions in the chat box. Okay. Okay, so if if, uh, if anyone has any questions, so I'll be very happy to give you the answer. I think that the participants have understood, you know, they talk <laughs> very nicely. There are no questions are you know ambiguities to clarify with the speaker so let's congratulate the speaker for a very nice presentation and if there are any questions you know the participants can always reach out to the speaker by email also they are welcome to contact the speaker and thank you once again professor manik pradhan for a very nice presentation now i hand over the session to professor ravindra pandey so thank you thank you professor thomas thank you uh thank you prof Pradhan for nicely explaining the cavity ring down spectroscopy and it's a uh, the the more I like that I had a kind of impression that it can only be used for the gas phase but you have shown that it's not only used for the gas phase but it can be used for the condensed phase yeah. and and it's a kind of example that the spectro spectroscopist can transfer the technology to the company also. So that is that is a wonderful part of it. I think that there are only few labs in India, particularly in the spectroscopy, where they have where where people have done the transfer transfer of technology to industry also. So it was a really wonderful to hear hear you, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation and giving a wonderful talk. So thank you, thank you, Ravindra. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So sir. I have a small announcement for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we will have. Three lectures tomorrow. Uh, the first one will be at 9.30 by Professor Sayan Bakchi, where he's going to speak about 2D IR spectroscopy. And the uh, second lecture will be given by me, where I will speak about structure and dynamic set complex interfaces. And in the evening, we have a wonderful uh, imaging lecture by Professor Sachin Dev Verma, where he's going to speak about how one can visualize the charge separation at heterojunction using transient, transient absorption microscopy. So with this, we end this session and I request all, you, all of you to join tomorrow at 9.30. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.